Hopefully everybody can hear me this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and talking about one of my favorite things, even if it's not a favorite subject matter, uh, when you get down into the nitty gritty of what invasive species are and what they can do here in Illinois. Andrew mentioned that I help coordinate the University of Illinois CAPS program. The CAPS program is the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program. Basically, this is a program that works with USDA APHIS PPQ to safeguard U.S. agricultural and environmental resources. And we do that by ensuring that new introductions of harmful plant pests and diseases are detected as soon as possible. And we do that by working together with state and federal agencies, universities, industry partners, scientific community, and other stakeholders on surveys as well as outreach and education. I guess one of the biggest things that we should do here is define what an invasive species is. An invasive species is simply an organism that causes ecological or economic harm in a new environment where it's not native. Invasive species are capable of causing extinctions of native plants and animals, reducing biodiversity. They also compete with native, native organisms for limited resources, and they also alternate alter habitats in our natural communities. There we go. The exact number of invasives in the U.S. is unknown, and that's not completely unexpected. We know that some cause damage um, that's very evident, and those numbers of invasives are in the thousands, um, and more enter the U.S. each day. Some of those invasive species garner lots of public attention, but many go unnoticed for many, many years. In many instances, it isn't until that population gets very high that we realize something is going on. For example, garlic mustard is sometimes fairly unnoticed until it takes over an area. Another example might be emerald ash borer. It often goes undetected in communities until residents realize that their ash trees are dying. It's really hard to put an estimate on the cost of invasive species. Figures um, from several years ago uh, indicate it costs more than two and a half billion dollars per year in the U.S. to control invasive species. And that number came out before we had outbreaks of Asian longhorn beetle in Ohio, spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania, brown marmorated stink bug along the East Coast, citrus greening in the South, and lots more around the U.S. So it really costs a lot of money in control, but then there's also the additional costs of other management strategies, or even it's even harder to put a dollar amount on how invasives can affect ecosystems, such as putting a value on trees to property values or um, a value on human health. Introductions will usually occur via one of three ways. We have natural introductions and lots of insects and even pathogen spores move naturally on jet streams. It's not unconceivable for them to be introduced on storm fronts and being in the Midwest you think about how we have southerly winds or jet streams that move across the U.S. and this might be how we see um, invasives moving um, from one U.S. location to another or from the west coast here to the Midwest. Some invasives are introduced deliber deliberately. Um, it's a bit harder to do now. We have a lot of safeguards in place, a lot of inspections that occur, um, but some people do bring organisms to the U.S. from other parts of the world for various reasons. Um, think about how gypsy moth was introduced so long ago and how it escaped and is now a huge problem throughout the Northeast and even in the upper Midwest. One of the primary way invasives are brought to the U.S. is accidentally. And this is how we deal with it, or one of the ways we deal with it here in the CAPS program. We are looking at accidental introductions and we're doing that by looking at what we consider high-risk pathways. You might ask, how do invasives get to Illinois? I mean, we're in the middle of the country, we're surrounded by corn and soybean fields, but in reality, 
Our state is full of potential introduction sites. We actually rank fifth in the U.S. for invasive species introductions, and that is behind Florida, New York, California, and Michigan. Our central geographic location actually means there's more ways for, for organisms to get here. We have a superior transportation system with the largest rail gateway in the nation. A lot of times, um, containers are moving from China, Asia, uh, in that general area, and they come on land over um, at Long Beach. They were there loaded on rail and come straight to Chicago, where those shipping containers are then stored for an indefinite amount of time, or they're then moved to other trains and dispersed from the Midwest, or put on trucks and move via highway. And we have an excellent interstate system throughout Illinois, more than 2,000 miles of interstate, and we have more than 34,000 miles of other highways. Lots of traffic moving through Illinois from all parts of the U.S. We also have O'Hare International Airport. It's the third busiest airport in the world, fourth busiest international airport in the U.S. behind JFK, LA and Miami. Lots of international passengers and international products are coming through O'Hare. We also have more than a thousand sawmills in the state of Illinois and an unknown number of firewood dealers. And as we look at different pathways, you can see how some of those will come into play. Nursery stock and commodities are some of the items that are moving in those high-risk high pathways. We often see nursery plants and other crop products, if you will. And that's a, a, a hundred registered sawmills. We have a lot of sawmills that are unregistered and that came from a question that popped up. I, mean, I don't know, Andrew, if I'm supposed to answer these as I go or not, but a um, hundred registered sawmills. But back to nursery stock and commodities, we often see these shipped around the U.S. and also from other parts of the world. You think about flower bulbs that are imported from different countries. We also see um, citrus, other fruits and veg vegetables moved from other countries as well as from different parts of the U.S. And while these products are routinely inspected, sometimes invasive species manage to slip between uh, the cracks, if you will. Uh, but ultimately, we do have plans and programs in place that minimize that happening. Our biggest risk is through containerized shipping and solid waste pack, solid wood packing material, excuse me. And I kind of hit on that a little bit earlier. The number of shipping containers that enter the U.S. each year continues to grow. We receive more than 11 million by sea, 11 million by truck, and 2.7 million by rail. And in this global economy, this is the primary shipping method of goods around the world. If we look a little bit more in depth at those containerized ship, shipping uh, pathways, we know that solid wood packing material, things like crates, pallets, wood dunnage and such, are associated with more than 50% of those containers. So we expect more than 50% of those containers entering the U.S. to contain solid wood packing material of some kind. We then know that approximately 97% of our quarantine, quarantine significant pests that are detected at ports are associated with solid wood packing material. Things like different bark beetles and longhorn beetles. And that is very hard to find as a lot of them come as immature larvae in the actual wood itself. But it's not just solid wood packing material that's a concern. Another pathway is wood, particularly raw wood, wood that still has bark intact, including uh, so, uh, veneer logs, saw logs, burl stumps, and our biggest one being firewood. Firewood is one of our um, most highly unregulated, if you will. Lots of firewood dealers um, 
mom and pop stands that sell along roadways. A lot of our tree killing insects and pathogens can be found in firewood, but you know, honestly, they can't move very far on their own. And when people move firewood, we can actually see those invasives jump hundreds of miles. So do you see a theme here? People are what are moving our invasive species. And here in Illinois, we create a, a list each year. We're very lucky to have a lot of public engagement and involvement with different organizations, including University of Illinois Extension, concerning invasive species. And we find we get lots of help from the public in terms of reports and finding things. In order to get the word out on what we consider our most unwanted invasives, we create this list each year. And there we go. In 2019, our what we would consider our most unwanted invasives here in Illinois would be spotted lanternfly, Asian longhorn beetle, red imported fire ant, gold spotted oak borer, old world bollworm, and Asian gypsy moth in regards to insects. We also include plant diseases as well as invasive plants on this list. Things like sudden oak death or boxwood blight, then mile a minute vine, salt cedar, hydrilla, and giant hogweed. And the possibilities are really endless on what we could include in this list. And we try to highlight things that we consider the greatest risk of being introduced, ones that might have the greatest impact to our Illinois economy or natural resources, and we look at things that um, are not necessarily known to occur here or have very limited distribution. Today I'm going to highlight a few of these, but I'm actually going to spend most of my time on spotted lanternfly, which is probably what we would consider the number one most unwanted for the state of Illinois here in 2019. And uh, hopefully uh, we can keep that at bay longer than that. We're going to start with gold spotted oak borer. This is a buprested beetle that is not known to occur in Illinois. It's currently found in California, and it's been causing issues to the native California oak species there since the late 1900s or early 2000s. They officially found it or first observed the outbreaks in 2004. And this beetle uh, has essentially caused extensive tree mortality to those uh, native oak species, specifically their California black oak. Now the California black oak is in the red oak family and we have uh, a pretty wide distribution of red oaks, particularly northern red oak here in Illinois, with potential for southern red oak in the southern part of the state. When you think of buprested beetles, the biggest invasive buprested beetle that we use as an example would be emerald ash borer. And we know what emerald ash borer has done to the ash community in Illinois. The gold spotted oak borer has the potential to be that detrimental to our red oaks in Illinois. So you can kind of see why that is a very important pest that we want to keep an eye out for here in Illinois. Old world bollworm is more of an agricultural pest and it makes our most unwanted list simply uh, the fact that it actually attacks more than 180 plant species. It's not necessarily limited to agricultural commodities. It could also potentially be a um, detriment to some of our fruit and vegetables commercial producers, as well as what we might see in our backyard gardens. It is also not known to have any populations here in Illinois. We've detected it in the U.S., in Florida, and again in uh, Puerto Rico. And those have just been interceptions or single um, finds, if you will. What makes this exceedingly hard in terms of uh, detection surveys is that it's identical in appearance to the corn earworm, which is a pest that we deal with regularly here in Illinois. It's identical in appearance, appearance both in the adult form as well as the larval form. The eggs are microscopic, so both eggs and larvae can very easily be moved 
unknowingly in host plants. And this is something that's being looked at throughout many ports in the U.S. It is a strong flyer and could migrate from the south should it be found um, just south of the U.S. border. Asian gypsy moth is also not known to occur in the U.S., but it is not only closely related to the European gypsy moth that we have in the U.S. and in the northern parts of Illinois, but it's also similar in, in appearance. They're almost identical in appearance with the exception that the Asian gypsy moth is just slightly larger. It's also a strong flyer. Asian gypsy moth females will fly whereas the European gypsy moth females do not. So we would expect the Asian gypsy moth, should it be found here, to spread more rapidly than the spread of the European gypsy moth. The European gypsy moth, uh, we've had lots of success with the Slow the Spread program here in Illinois and throughout the northeast part of the U.S., and that has slowed the natural spread of gypsy moth in the U.S., a lot in the recent years. The larvae of gypsy moth are voracious feeders and can rapidly, rapidly defoliate neighborhoods or natural areas very, very quickly. And when you have severe defoliation over several years, we also then see rapid tree death that comes along with it. Asian longhorn beetle isn't really a stranger to Illinois. It's something that we've dealt with in years past. It was first discovered in Chicago in 1998 in several different locations. And an abbreviated history is that we did extreme tree removal in those areas along with chemical treatments in order to be able to completely eradicate Asian longhorn beetle from the state in 2008. While it is not currently found in Illinois, there are several locations throughout the U.S. that are currently battling Asian longhorn beetle, that being New York and New Jersey. I believe that was recently declared eradicated in parts of Massachusetts, but the closest population of Asian longhorn beetle is in Ohio, and it's actually in an area where they're also battling emerald ash borer and thousand cankers disease of walnut. And so you can see in an area how you deal with one invasive insect would be a problem. And when you're dealing with three invasive species at the same time, could be quite the battle. When we look at, at the identification of Asian, long, Asian longhorn beetle, it is a large, somewhat obvious beetle. Adults are three quarters to one and a half inches in length. They're black in color with white spots. They also have striped antennae that are one and a half to two and a half times the length of the body. So big beetle, even bigger antennae. Larvae are a little bit harder to ID. In fact, they're a lot harder to ID. They are are cream colored, cylindrical with no legs, and can be up to two and a half inches long. They are similar in appearance to a lot of other bark boring insects and cannot usually be identified by the untrained eye. When we look at the life cycle of Asian longhorn beetle, we start with the adult females and they'll chew depressions into the bark of different hardwood trees. As they're chewing they are also going to basically find a spot to lay an egg and this egg is extremely small about the size of a rice grain and they lay that under the bark at each site. Females can lay up to 90 eggs in their lifetime. Within two weeks the egg hatches and the larvae bores into the tree where they feed on the living tissues that's carrying water and nutrients and basically affect the growth of the tree, but from underneath the bark. After several weeks, that larvae then tunnels deeper into the tree tissue and it continues to feed and develop over the winter. 
As they feed, they form tunnels and galleries throughout the tree. And over that course of the year, the larvae is going to molt, pupate, and develop into an adult. The adult beetles emerge from the pupae, and they essentially chew their way out of the tree, and they leave large, round exit holes about the size of a dime. So large exit holes in trees could potentially be indicative of Asian longhorn beetle, except we do have lots of different uh, bark beetles and other insects that feed on trees and have large exit holes. One of the big things we do need is the presence of an actual larvae or a beetle to confirm its presence at that location. But things we can look for, one is what kind of tree are we looking at? Asian longhorn beetle will actually feed on dozens of different species from different plant families, but they do seem to prefer maples, elms, and willows. And if you look at the tree, we have a very large exit hole about the size of a dime. You can see chewing scars from the adult females. And as you're cutting dead trees, you can see how the larvae has tunneled deep within to the tissue of the tree. Very devastating uh, in terms of injury. Signs of a Asian longhorn beetle will start to show up about three to four years after the infestation. We could see that sooner depending on the overall health of the tree. And tree death occurs uh, within the following years after that um, initial signs of infestation. In general, heavily infested trees do not recover and they do not regenerate. So remo tree removal becomes primary form of getting rid of this pest and we use in, uh, injections to help protect trees from their presence in area or protect from them in areas where they are present. We do have Asian longhorn beetle look-likes within Illinois. And these are probably the insects we most frequently get calls about. The biggest one being the cottonwood borer. Asian longhorn beetles are black with white spots. Cottonwood borer is white with black. So it's the inverse of Asian longhorn beetle. We also have a couple Sawyers, other uh, longhorn beetles that are dark colored with different variations of white spots that can easily be mistaken for Asian longhorn beetle. And then we, every once in a while we do get the call from someone who has seen the eyed click beetle. While a very cool looking insect, if you will, uh, it doesn't have the very long antennae that the Asian longhorn beetle has. Now to on to spotted lanternfly, which is the main event, if you will, for um, this particular webinar. Uh, spotted lanternfly is our latest and greatest threat uh, to the state of Illinois and actually throughout much of the U.S. This is a sap feeding plant hopper, very vibrant in color, but they're also small, but on the large end for um, plant hoppers. The nymphs develop through four stages and all of these stages are wingless. The first three are black with white spots and they almost appear tick-like, small black ticks with white spots and they're not actually ticks. As they approach the fourth instar they start to develop red patches on the body and they start growing a little bit so they become a little over a half inch long and become a little bit more noticeable. Adults are one and a half inches long. When at rest, the, wing, the forewings cover those vibrant orange or red colored hind wings. So we're looking at grayish tan wings with black spots near the base. If you are lucky enough to see them with the wings spread, you'll also see that the hind wings have, are very bright red at the base with an adjacent black mark towards the end with a white band. Spotted lanternfly was first 
identified in Pennsylvania in 2014. At this time, we have no known current populations in Illinois. It is, I don't want to say widespread in Pennsylvania, but in the areas where it is present, there are some very big populations. And what we've seen over the past couple of years is the population or spotted lanternfly popping up in neighboring states. It, we've now identified it in Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, and Massachusetts. A few of those were single insects found at a location, so there's not necessarily an established population. However, like many invasives, things tend to go unnoticed for several years until populations build up enough that they become noticeable. And that's one of the greatest fears on spotted lanternflies, that is uh, what we're going to see. If we take a look at the breakdown of the spotted lanternfly life cycle, females will lay eggs from September through October. And what they're, where we see that is on the preferred host of Tree of Heaven. But in actuality, while they prefer Tree of Heaven and come back to Tree of Heaven as adults, they will lay their eggs on any smooth surface. Whether that be trees, tree bark, limbs, they will actually go off trees and we will see it being laid on stone. Uh, trash cans, grills, and what we've seen with some recent research out of Pennsylvania is they actually like to lay eggs on rusty surfaces. And those tend to be particularly attractive. And this is a cause for concern when you start thinking about rusty rail cars and how it could very easily move from one end of the US to the other. When spotted lanternfly lay egg masses, they have a gray mud-like covering which become, can become dry and cracked over time. Basically, this covering protects the eggs. Old egg masses, and that's the picture on the right, will have four to seven columns of seed-like eggs, and that's where those nymphs will hatch from. Those nymphs hatch in the spring, and in general, late April to early May, depending on how fast things warm up each year. So that's a pretty wide range, and we could see um, that extend even into later May, potentially. Those nymphs will pass through their four instars, and, and then we should start to see adults in late summer, as early as June, um, and they will be present through fall. And what we see with these adults is that they tend to congregate. Um, and will form large congregations. They'll feed on lots of different house plants. Some of our biggest concerns are grapes, tree of heaven, uh, different tree species like willow and maple. And the longer that we're able to look at what's going on in Pennsylvania, we're realizing that that host range is continuing to get larger, include other small fruits, potentially apples. You look at its potential impact on Christmas trees as well. And the Christmas tree movement um, has also has cause for concern of how this pest may move from state to state or from coast to coast, if you will. Spotted lanternfly is native to China, India, Vietnam. It was also introduced to South Korea and Japan, and we originally got a lot of our background information of how this species acts as an invasive from research out of South Korea where spotted lanternfly has become a huge pest of grape there. As far as we know, spotted lanternfly uses, utilizes 70 species of plants in the US. Like I said before, grapes, uh, plums, cherries, nectarines, apricots, also looking at potential in almonds, apples, willows, 
different hardwoods and pines. So we feel that the greatest threat in Illinois is to our grape industry, our tree fruit industry, as well as our nursery and timber industries could also see potential impact from this invasive pest. When we really start looking at what spotted lanternfly injury looks like, it's not necessarily what you may think. We know that plant hoppers are sap feeders, so they have piercing sucking mouth parts. They're not actually feeding on the grapes or apples themselves. What they're feeding on is the grape vines in the tree trunks of apples and other tree species. And you can see in these pictures, the sheer number of feeding is going to be, be an issue. And so when we get that loss of sap from the different stems and leaves or tree trunks, we can cause a reduction of photosynthesis and that affects overall plant health. The other issue we are seeing with spotted lanternfly is that they create massive amounts of honeydew. When you think of aphids and the, uh, them as sap feeders and when you get large populations of aphids, it produces lots of honeydew, sticky, sticky substance made up of lots of sugars. So that's not only coating plants affecting photosynthesis, it also promotes uh, sooty mold growth. And so we're also seeing lots of uh, black mold or sooty mold out in Pennsylvania as well. The one thing that we don't necessarily have a good handle on, but we know it is an issue, is the potential to affect the quality of life. And when you see numbers of spotted lanternfly like this, my mind kind of goes to brown marmorated stink bug. We know that brown marmorated stink bug can cause injury to crops, uh, fruits and vegetables, but it's affecting us as a nuisance pest tends to uh, overshadow some of its other issues. And the same could be uh, said about spotted lanternfly. When we see large numbers of spotted lanternfly like this where they have in Pennsylvania, the populations are so high that the honeydew is dripping from trees, it's coating porches, porch steps, swing sets, playground equipment, essentially keeping people inside and affecting their quality of life, if you will. While instances of this is small in Pennsylvania, they are seeing it and then you start looking at the number of adult spotted lanternfly and so you're getting plant injury plus the honeydew issues and we're having a huge cause for concern in those areas. Lots of different things to look at in terms of spotted lanternfly lookalikes. The first we have lookalikes for egg masses. Um, Spotted lanternfly egg masses, like I said, have that gray coating. There's actually other egg masses or egg cases that could uh, appear similar to that of spotted lanternfly. One of the biggest ones we get questions about is gypsy moth egg masses. Gypsy moth egg masses tend to be a little bit more hairy than the clay-like coating of sp spotted lanternfly. But when we start looking at things like Chinese uh, mantis egg cases, or even sometimes lichen on bark, we'll also get a few calls about that. The lichen doesn't necessarily have the depth, if you will, as a spotted lanternfly egg case, casing cover. And then you also think about how some insects will lay their eggs directly on bark, and it doesn't have the smooth coat covering is what we see with spotted lanternfly egg masses. It's very hard to spot spotted lanternfly immature 
nymphs. They're very small. Like I mentioned before, they're about the size of ticks when we're in that first through third instar. When they get older with the bright red coloration, that's when they tend to be more visible and they might more easily be confused with wheel bug nymphs or assassin bug nymphs. They won't, those particular insects won't be nearly as vividly colored and they won't have the very bright white spots on their bodies either. And finally, adult lookalikes. We have several uh, moth species that could potentially be similar. The, the one that we tend or may tend to get the most calls on is a tiger moth only because it has very similar colorations in terms of grayish brown and that vivid orange or red. But tiger moths have st the stripes on their veins or their venation is not spotted like the spotted lanternfly. And of course, potentially other tree hoppers, although they're not quite as similar in size or coloration. So with invasive species, we ask ourselves, or I ask you, what can you do? And it's very simple for me to put up here to be familiar with common regional and local pests. And it may or may not be easy for you, but no one knows your backyard like you do. You know the different things that are there, the different things that come through the season. Be familiar with the typical pests that are important in your area. Know your seasonal pest patterns. Is this the right time of year for something to be feeding on this on this particular plant? Is this a pest I've seen before? Is this an insect I've seen before? Know your typical weather patterns because sometimes that does affect how plants look. It may not necessarily be diseased, but this is a, a particularly dry year and this is what happens uh, to this plant when we have that drier season. And what we do is we ask you to report. If you see something unusual, not common in your area, the best thing you can do is report it. And we always say that we would rather have a thousand reports of nothing, essentially, or no consequence, than for us to miss that one that could potentially save a lot of heartache later on. The earlier we detect something, the better chance we have of eradicating it or managing it or just simply getting rid of it. And so there's lots of different ways to report potential invasive pests here in Illinois. You, of course, can go to your local University of Illinois Extension office. You can always email me. I have my regular email address at kcooka at illinois.edu. We have a general email. If you can't remember my name, simply emailing invasives at illinois.edu gets your report to me. And as we ramp up education and outreach on spotted lanternfly, our spotted lanternfly uh, task group uh, has its own email address as well as other things and that will go to a group of us there we can follow up and check out any potential reports and having the insect or plant in hand is always good put it in a crush proof sealed container to get it somewhere if you don't have anywhere to put it take a photo take a good quality photo and send that to us via email and most importantly, it, everything is in the details. When, where, specifics of the location, the more information you can give us, the better shot we have of finding out what it is. And if we have to work backwards from where it might, might have been, how did it get here? And really just detail, detail, detail gets you so far with invasive species. Keep up with the latest information on invasives here in Illinois. Keep track of what's going on at your extension office. Your educators around the state have lots of good information that they're sharing. 
either through blog posts, newsletter articles, and programming. We also have our University of Illinois Home Yard and Garden Newsletter, IPM Bulletin, and the Illinois Fruit and Vegetable News, where we're not only sharing the latest on invasives, but also those regular pests that you might be encountering in everyday life. And then you're always welcome to follow me either via my webpage for Illinois Pest Survey, or you can find us on social media on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And here's my contact information if you need to get a hold of me. Uh, there's my email at kcook8, as well as my office phone number at 217-333-1005.